Book One, Chapter Ten of Strangers and Pilgrims by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Strangers and Pilgrims, Chapter Ten. Who knows what's fit for us? Had fate proposed bliss here should sublimate my being, had I signed the bond, still one must lead some life beyond have a bliss to die with dim descried whether lord paulyn's attentions were indeed meaningless or whether serious intentions tending towards matrimony lurked behind them was a question whose solution time the revealer of all secrets did not hasten to afford the viscount spent about three weeks in devonshire during which period he contrived to see a good deal of the vicarage people calling at least twice a week upon one pretence or another and dragging out each visit to its extremest length he was not an intellectual person and had contrived to exist since the conclusion of his university career without opening a book except only such volumes as could assist him in the supervision of his stables or aid his calculations as a speculator on the turf his conversation was therefore in no manner enlivened or adorned by the wit or wisdom of others but he had a little stock of anecdotes and reminiscences of his career in the fashionable world and of the fellows he had encountered there wherewith to entertain his hearers he had also a yacht the pixie whose performances were a source of interest to him and which afforded an occasional variety to his stable talk in fact he made himself so agreeable in a general way during his visits to the vicarage that mrs chevenix pronounced him the most entertaining and original young man it had ever been her good fortune to encounter elizabeth was not always at home when he called but he contrived to spin out his visit until her return an endeavour in which he was much assisted by mrs chevenix who took care to acquaint him with her disapproval of this parish work and her fear that dear elizabeth was undermining her health by these pious labours if she were an ordinary girl i should regard the thing in quite another light said aunt chevenix but elizabeth is not an ordinary girl an opinion in which the viscount concurred with enthusiasm it's all that curate's doing he said why don't you use your influence against that fellow mrs chevenix oh you're jealous of the curate are you thought the matron then perhaps we can bring you on a little faster by that means she gave a plaintive sigh and shook her head doubtfully i regret to say that my influence goes for nothing when mr ford is in the question she said he has contrived to impress elizabeth with the idea that he is a kind of saint you don't think she cares for him asked the viscount eagerly not in the vulgar worldly sense of the words dear lord paulyn said mrs chevenix but she has a sensitive impressionable nature and he has contrived to exercise an influence which sometimes alarms me she is a girl who would hardly astonish me if she were to go over to rome and immure herself for life in a convent that would be a pity said the viscount and it would be a greater pity if she were to marry some stick of a curate but he did not commit himself to any stronger expression than this and he left devonshire without making elizabeth luttrell an offer a fact which gave rise to a few sisterly sarcasms on the part of gertrude and diana blanche was more good-natured and was really desirous of having a nobleman for her brother-in-law but before he departed from his native place lord paulyn dined two or three times at the vicarage having hung about late in the afternoon in such a manner as to invite mr luttrell's hospitality i don't much wonder that he shirks his mother's dinners remarked that short-sighted incumbent nor did he see any special cause for self-congratulation when the viscount spent his evenings in hanging over the piano while elizabeth sang or in teaching her the profound theories of ecarte if the vicar was slow to perceive anything peculiar in this gentleman's conduct there were plenty of more acute observers in hawley who kept a record of his movements and told each other over afternoon teacups 
that lord paulyn must be smitten by one of the vicarage girls before the young man had left the neighbourhood this rumour had reached the ears of malcolm ford he heard this scrap of gossip with a somewhat bitter smile remembering the sunday luncheon at the vicarage and to whom the viscount's attention had been exclusively given i'm hardly sorry for it he said to himself god knows that i have fought against my own folly in loving her so dearly loving her with no higher hope or thought than a passionate delight in her beauty a blind worship of herself a sinful indulgence for her very faults which have seemed in her so many additional charms knowing her all the while to be the last of women to help me on in the path i have chosen for myself the very woman to hold me backward to keep me down by the dead weight of her worldliness i shall have reason to be grateful to lord paulyn if he comes between us and makes a sudden end of my madness and yet with a curious inconsistency when the curate met elizabeth in one of the cottages he saluted her with so gloomy a brow and so cold an air that the girl went home miserable wondering how she had offended him that he could be jealous was an idea that never entered into her mind for she had never hoped that he loved her she went home that afternoon thinking him the coldest and hardest of mankind a man whose gloomy soul no act of submission could conciliate went home and avenged herself for that outrage by a desperate flirtation with the viscount who happened to eat his farewell dinner at the vicarage that evening lord paulyn departed and made no sign yet it is certain that he left hawley as deeply in love with elizabeth luttrell as it was in his nature to love any woman upon this earth but he was a gentleman of a somewhat cold and calculating temper and was supported and sustained in all the events of life by an implicit belief in his own merits and the value of his position and surroundings he was not a man to throw himself away lightly elizabeth was a charming girl and in his opinion the handsomest woman he had ever seen and the very fittest to lend a grace and glory to his life in the eyes of his fellow-men a wife he might be proud to see pointed out as his property on race-courses or on the box-seat of his drag as his favourite team drew themselves together for the start on a field day at hyde park corner but on the other hand there was no denying that such a match would be a very paltry alliance for him to make bringing him neither advantageous connections nor addition to his fortune and if on sober reflection at a distance from the object of his passion he found that he could live without elizabeth luttrell why he might have reason to congratulate himself upon his judicious withdrawal from that too delightful society mind i shall expect to see you in town early in the season he said to elizabeth when making his adieu a speech which he felt committed him to nothing you mustn't forget your promise to show us the university boat race said mrs chevenix with her vivacious air she felt not a little disappointed that nothing more decisive had come of the young man's admiration that he should be able thus to tear himself away unfettered and uncompromised she had fondly hoped that he would linger on at ashcombe till in some impassioned moment he should cast his fortunes at the foot of his enchantress it was somewhat bitter therefore to see him depart in this cool manner with only vague anticipations of possible meetings during the london season mrs chevenix was well aware of a fact which the viscount pretended to ignore namely that her set was not his set and that it was only by means of happy accidents or diplomatic struggles that she and her niece could hope to meet him in society but he will call no doubt she said to herself having taken a special care to furnish him with her address elizabeth gave a great sigh of relief as the vicarage door closed for the last time upon her admirer she had been gratified by his admiration she had listened to him with an air of interest had brightened and sparkled as she talked to him but it was dull work at the best there was no real sympathy and it was an unspeakable relief to know that he was gone thank heaven that's over she exclaimed and now i can live my own life again 
after the viscount's departure mrs chevenix began to find life at hawley a burden too heavy for her to bear the ceremonial call which she and her two nieces had made at ashcombe about a week after the dinner there had resulted in no new invitation nor in any farther visit from lady paulyn intimacy with the inexorable dowager which aunt chevenix had done her utmost to achieve was evidently an impossibility so about a week before christmas mrs chevenix and her confidential maid left the vicarage to the heartfelt satisfaction of mr luttrell's household and not a little to the relief of that hospitable gentleman himself december was nearly over a long dreary month it had seemed to elizabeth and since that sunday luncheon at which lord paulyn had assisted malcolm ford had paid no visit to the vicarage elizabeth had seen him two or three times in the course of her district visiting and on each occasion he had seemed to her colder and sterner of manner than on the last gertrude was the only member of the family who made any remark upon this falling away of mr ford's the vicar knew that he worked harder than any other labourer who had ever come into that vineyard and was not surprised that he should lack leisure for morning calls nor had he ever been a frequent visitor at the vicarage but gertrude remarked with an injured air that of late he had ceased from calling altogether i have no doubt he heard that lord paulyn was always here she observed and of course that kind of society would not be likely to suit him i can't see that papa's curates have any right to select our society for us exclaimed blanche firing up at this lord paulyn was no particular favourite of mine for he used to take about as much notice of me as if i were a chair or a table and mr ford is always nice but i still can't see that he's any right to object to our visitors no one spoke of such a right blanche answered her eldest sister but mr ford is free to select his own society and it's only natural that he should avoid a person of lord paulyn's calibre elizabeth felt this defection keenly it was not as if she had neglected her duties or fallen away from the right path in any palpable manner she had gone on with her work unflinchingly even when depressed by his coldness her spirits had flagged and the work had grown wearisome she had been constant in her attendance at the early services on dismal winter mornings when the outer world looked bleak and uninviting she had struggled to be good according to her lights perceiving no sinfulness in that flirtation with lord paulyn which had helped to fill her empty life she missed the excitement of these flirtations when lord paulyn was gone it was all very well to declare that he had bored her and to express herself relieved by his departure but she missed that agreeable ministration to her vanity it had been pleasant to know when she made her simple toilet for the home dinner that every fresh knot of ribbon in her hair made her lovelier in the eyes of a man whose admiration the world counted worth winning pleasant to discover that fascinations which had no power to touch the cold heart of malcolm ford possessed an overwhelming influence for the master of ashcombe yet the end of her flirtation with the viscount was hardly less humiliating to her than the coldness of the curate he loved and he rode away she began to think that she had no real power over the hearts of men that she could only startle and bewitch them by her beauty hold them for but the briefest space in her thrall if the viscount's admiration had gone a step farther and he had made her an offer what would have been her reply that was a question which she had asked herself many times of late and for which she could find no satisfactory answer the prospect was almost too dazzling for her to contemplate with a steady gaze had not a brilliant marriage been the dream of her girlhood a vision first evoked by some prophetic utterances of aunt chevenix when elizabeth was only a tall slip of a girl in a pinafore practising major and minor scales on a battered old piano in the schoolroom she had dreamed of horses and carriages and opera boxes and country seats from the hour when she first learned the value of her growing loveliness at the feet of that worldly teacher all that was basest in her nature 
her ignorant yearning for splendour and pleasure her belief in her divine right to be prosperous and happy had been fostered half unconsciously perhaps by aunt chevenix mrs luttrell was the weakest and simplest of women and had always referred to her sister-in-law as the very oracle of social existence and had fondly believed in that lady as a leader of london fashion to her dying day there had been no home influence in the vicarage household to counteract the chevenix influence and although elizabeth took a pride in defying her aunt upon occasions she was not the less her faithful disciple could she have refused such an offer from lord paulyn could she of her own free will have put aside at once and for ever since two such chances would hardly come into her obscure life all the delights and triumphs of this world all the pleasures she had dreamed of it hardly seemed possible that she could have been so heroic as to say no it was very certain on the other hand that she did not care for reginald paulyn that his handsome face had no charm for her that the lingering clasp of his strong hand sent no thrill to her heart that his society after the first half-hour became a bore to her it was quite as certain that there was another man whose coldest look quickened the beating of her heart whose lightest touch had a magical influence and for whose sake poverty would have seemed no hardship obscurity no affliction by whose side she could have felt herself strong enough to make life's pilgrimage over ever so thorny a road i could hardly have been so demented as to refuse him she thought remembering that this one man for whom she could have cheerfully sacrificed all her visions of earthly glory had no desire to profit by her self-abnegation christmas was close at hand and the luttrell girls were busy from morning till evening with the decoration of the two churches but elizabeth performed her share of this labour with a somewhat listless air and did a good deal more looking on than gertrude or diana approved she was beginning to be very tired of her work tired even of her poor people despite their affection for her it seemed altogether such a dreary business uncheered by mr ford's counsel or approbation not that he would have withheld his counsel had she taken the trouble to ask for it but she could not bring herself to do that she remembered that october day in the vicarage garden when they had walked together over the fallen leaves while autumn winds moaned dismally and autumn clouds obscured the sun that day when they had seemed so near to each other and when the dull grey world had been lighted with that light that was never on sea or shore the light of a great joy what would she not have done for his sake if he had only taken the trouble to order her if he had been a redemptorist father and had presented her with a cat and nine tails wherewith to go and scourge herself she would have taken the whip from him with a smile and departed cheerfully to do his bidding but he had asked no more from her than from any other member of that little band of ladies who helped him in the care of his poor and he distinguished her from that little band only by his peculiar coldness she flung down her garland of ivy and holly with an impatient air in the midst of a little cluster of ladies working busily in the vestry of st clement's the decorations whereof were but half completed i shall do no more she said my fingers ache and smart horribly i am tired of the whole business tired of parish work altogether miss melvin looked up at her friend wonderingly with her meek blue eyes why lizzie i am surprised to hear you say that she exclaimed mr ford says you are the best of all his district visitors because you are sympathetic and the poor people understand you oh, i feel very much honoured by his praise said elizabeth with a scornful little laugh but as he has never taken the trouble to give me the slightest encouragement of late i begin to find the work a little disheartening elizabeth has an insatiable appetite for praise remarked gertrude and i dare say she's been not a little spoiled by lord paulyn's absurd flatteries you have been rather fortunate in escaping that kind of contamination gertie replied elizabeth whose temper was by no means at its best on this christmas eve but i assure you it's rather nice to have a viscount for one's slave 
oh even when his bondage sits so lightly that he's able to shake it off at any moment said gertrude to which elizabeth would have no doubt replied but for the sound of a firm tread upon the stone threshold and the sudden opening of the door which had been left ajar by the busy workers it was mr ford on his round of inspection elizabeth wondered whether he had overheard that shallow unladylike talk about lord paulyn she picked up her unfinished garland and set to work again hurriedly glad of any excuse for hiding her face from his cold gaze he did not stop long in the vestry only long enough for a general good morning and a few questions about the decorations nor did he address one word to elizabeth luttrell her face was still bent over her work and the wounded fingers were moving busily when she heard the door shut behind him and his departing footstep on the pavement of the church he had come to the vestry door just in time to hear elizabeth's flippant speech about lord paulyn a speech which to his mind seemed to reveal the utter shallowness and worthlessness of the woman he had suffered himself to love and yet she has been able to cheat me into a belief in the latent nobility of her nature she has been able to bewilder my reason as she has bewitched my heart he said to himself as he walked slowly down the quiet aisle and out into the bleak churchyard as she has distracted me from better thoughts and higher hopes and has been an evil influence in my life from the first fatal hour in which i let her creep into my heart even the vicar's friendly invitation for christmas day was rejected by mr ford he would have been very happy to join that agreeable circle he wrote but it was a pleasure which he felt it safer to deny himself the services on that day were numerous there were sick people he had promised to see in the course of the day and he should hardly have time for anything else and so on he spent his day between the two churches and those sick rooms and his night in solitary reading and meditation trying to lift his soul to that higher level whither it had been wont to soar before an earthly passion clogged its wings that he would as far as it was possible to him in his position as mr luttrell's curate renounce and abjure the society of mr luttrell's daughter was a resolution that he had arrived at very promptly on hearing the town talk about lord paulyn's frequent visits at the vicarage i will not trust myself near her he said to himself she has deceived me in the past and would deceive me again in the future i have no power to resist her witchery except by separating myself from her for ever he was just strong enough to do this he had just sufficient force of will to avoid the siren knowing the houses in which she was most likely to be found her customary hours the way she took in her walks knowing almost every detail of her daily life and how easy it would be for him to meet her not once did he swerve from the rigid line which he had marked out for his conduct he saw the familiar figure in the distance sometimes and never quickened his step to overtake it he heard that she was expected in a cottage where he was visiting and hurried his departure straightway rather than run the hazard of meeting her but it is hardly by these means that a man learns to forget the woman he loves it is a kind of schooling that is apt to end another way perhaps no man ever yet forgot by trying to forget but he is on the highway to forgetfulness when he tries to remember a poison had entered into malcolm ford's life that sacred calling which demands the service of a heart uncorrupted by earthly passion began to weigh upon him like a bondage it was not that he was in any manner weary of his office but rather that he began to feel himself unfitted for it a deadly sense of monotony crept into his mind he began to doubt his powers of usefulness to fancy that his career at hawley was like the round of a horse in a mill grinding on for ever and tending toward no higher results than that common daily bread the natural result of these languors those painful doubts of his own worthiness was to turn his thoughts in that direction whither they had turned not unfrequently in the days when he had been better contented with his lot 
he began to think more seriously than ever upon the missionary life which comes nearer to the apostolic form of service than the smooth pastures of the church at home he collected all the information he could obtain upon this subject wrote to men who had the work at heart and who knew where a worker of his stamp was most wanted i have a vigorous constitution he wrote to one of his correspondents and have hardly ever known a day's illness i am therefore not afraid of climate and if i do finally determine to go i should wish to go where such labour as i can give would be of real value where a weaker man might be unfit to face the difficulties and dangers which i feel myself qualified to cope with and overcome do not think that i am boasting of my strength i only wish to remind you that my former profession has in some measure inured me to peril and hardship and that i should be glad to be able to employ some of that military spirit still inherent in my composition in the nobler service to which it is now my privilege to belong i want to feel myself a soldier and servant of christ church militant here on earth in every sense of the word and i do not in my present mood find the work of a rural parish adequate for the satisfaction of this desire End of chapter ten book one chapter eleven of strangers and pilgrims by mary elizabeth braddon this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org strangers and pilgrims chapter eleven tis the pest of love that fairest joys give most unrest that things of delicate and tenderest worth are swallowed all and made a seared death by one consuming flame it doth immerse and suffocate true blessings in a curse half happy by comparison of bliss is miserable that christmas at hawley was not a peculiarly festive season mr luttrell being happily rid of his sister was indisposed for father society preferring to bask in the genial glow of his hearth untrammelled by the duties of hospitality so the luttrell girls sat around the fire on christmas evening in a dismal circle while their father silent and motionless as the sculptured figure of some household god slumbered peacefully in his easy chair behind the banner screen that had shaded the fair features of aunt chevenix i really do wish that boy baby had lived exclaimed blanche after a long silence alluding to an infant scion of the house of luttrell which had perished untimely of course i know he'd have been a nuisance to us all brothers always are but still he'd have been something he must have imparted a little variety to the tenor of our miserable lives papa would have been obliged to send him to oxford or cambridge where he would have got into debt for shirt studs and meerschaum pipes and things no doubt but he would have brought home nice young men perhaps in the long vacation and that would be some amusement he might have touted for papa in a gentlemanly way and brought home young men to be coached blanche exclaimed gertrude you positively grow more revoltingly vulgar in your ideas every day oh let the poor child talk cried diana with a stifled yawn i wonder she's spirit enough left to be vulgar any invertebrate creature can be ladylike but vulgarity requires a certain amount of animal spirits and i'm sure such a miserable christmas as this is a damper for any one's vivacity elizabeth said nothing she sat on a low seat opposite the fire motionless as her slumbering father but with her great dark eyes wide open gazing dreamily at the smouldering yule log which had dropped its white ashes slowly and silently into a deep chasm of dull red coal she had sat thus for the last half hour thinking her own thoughts and taking no part in her sister's desultory snatches of talk oh she sat like patience on a monument smiling at grief exclaimed diana presently exasperated by this silence upon my word lizzie you are not the best of company for a winter's night by the fire i do not pretend to be good company replied elizabeth coolly oh how different it would be if lord paulyn were here said diana whose temper had been somewhat soured by the dreariness of that long evening then you'd be all smiles and bewitchment 
i should do my best to entertain a visitor of course i do not consider myself bound to entertain you poor lizzie murmured diana with an insolent air of compassion we ought not to be hard on you it is rather a trial for any girl to have a coronet dangled before her eyes in that tantalising manner and nothing to come of her conquest after all do you mean to say that i ever angled for lord paulyn cried elizabeth with a sudden flush of scornful anger or that i could not have him if i chose i mean to say replied diana in a provokingly deliberate manner that you and aunt chevenix tried your very hardest to catch him and did not succeed perhaps you look forward to seeing him in london and subjugating him there but i fancy that if a woman cannot bring an admirer to her feet in the first flush of her conquest she is hardly likely to bring him there later he has time for reflection and distraction you see and a man who has sufficient prudence to keep himself uncommitted as cleverly as lord paulyn did would be the very man to cure himself of a foolish infatuation i don't mean to say anything offensive but of course a marriage with one of us would be a very disadvantageous alliance for a man in his position you are extremely wise my dear di and have acquired your wisdom in the bitter school of experience but i doubt if you are quite infallible and to show you that i am ready to back my opinion as lord paulyn says i will bet you poor dear mamma's pearl necklace my only valuable possession that if he and i live so long i will be lady paulyn before next christmas day a foolish wager to make perhaps when her heart was given utterly to another man but these little sisterly skirmishes always brought out the worst points in elizabeth's character she had been thinking too as she watched the softly dropping ashes of all the grandeurs and pleasures with which she might have surrounded herself at such a season as this were she the wife of viscount paulyn thinking of that dismal old house at ashcombe and the transformation that she might effect there the spacious rooms glowing with warm light filled with pleasant people new furniture splendid draperies life and colour throughout that mansion where now reigned a death-like gloom and greyness as if the dust of many generations had settled and become fixed there covering all things with one sombre hue these visions were strangely sweet to her shallow soul and mingled with the thoughts of those possible triumphs there was always the thought of malcolm ford and the impression that such a marriage would make upon him he would see that at least some one can care for me she said to herself that if i am not good enough for him i may be good enough for his superior in rank and fortune and then came a vision of that tall figure and grave face among the witnesses of her wedding he would take his subordinate part in the service no doubt by the vicar of hawley father of the bride assisted by the reverend malcolm ford oh, he wouldn't care she thought he would not even be angry with me but he would preach me a sermon about my increased means of usefulness he would expect me to become a sister of mercy on a wider scale after that joyless christmas time life seemed to elizabeth luttrell to become almost intolerable by reason of its dreariness she gave up her spasmodic attempts at active usefulness altogether she had emptied her purse for her poor wearied herself in going to and fro between the vicarage and their hovels steeped herself to the lips in their difficulties and sorrows and to some of them at least had contrived to render herself very dear and having done this she all at once abandoned them stayed at home and brooded upon her vexations sat for long hours at her piano playing wild passionate music which seemed like a stormy voice answering her stormy heart let him come to me and remonstrate with me again she said to herself looking up with haggard eyes at the drawing-room door as if she expected to see that tall figure appear at her invocation let him come to reprove me and i will tell him that i am tired of working without any earthly reward that i have neither faith nor patience to labour for a recompense that i am only to win perhaps half a century hence in heaven and who knows if i should see his face there or hear his voice praising me 
but the days went by and mr forde took no heed of this second defection one thing only gave colour to elizabeth's life in this hopeless time and that was the daily service in the big empty church of st clement's at which she saw the cold grave face that had usurped so fatal a power over her soul once in every day she must needs see him once in every day she must needs hear his voice and it was to see and hear him that she rose early on those cheerless winter mornings and shared the devotions of a few feeble old women in poke bonnets and a sprinkling of maiden ladies with frost-pinched noses showing rosy tipped beneath their veils it was not a pure worship which was wafted heavenward with elizabeth's orisons rather no worship at all but an impious adoration of the creature instead of the creator in every word in the familiar prayers every sentence in the morning lessons she heard the voice of the man she loved and nothing more his voice with its slow solemn depths of music his face with its earnest eyes forever overlooking her these were the sole elements of that daily service she went to church to see and to hear malcolm ford and knew in her heart of hearts that it was for this alone she went and in some remorseful moments wondered that heaven's swift vengeance did not descend upon so impious a creature how could i bear my life if i were married to another man and it were a deadly sin to think of him she asked herself wonderingly and then argued with herself that in an utterly new life a life filled to overflowing with the pleasures that had never yet been within her reach pleasures that would have all the freshness and delight of novelty she must surely find it an easy matter to shut malcolm ford's image out of her heart in what is he different from all other men that i should go on lamenting him for ever she thought if i lived in the world i should meet his superiors every day of my life but living out of the world seeing only such people as frederick melvin and his fellow-creatures it's hardly wonderful that i think him a demigod and then in the next moment with a passionate scorn of her own arguments she would exclaim but he is above all other men there's no one like him in that great world i'm so ignorant of there's no one else whose coldest word could seem sweeter than the praise of other men there is no one else whose very shadow across my path could be more to me than the love of all the world besides in this blank pause of her life when all the machinery of her existence which had for a long time been gradually growing abominable to her by reason of its monotony seemed all at once to become too hateful for endurance like a long dusty road which for a certain distance the pilgrim treads with a kind of hopefulness until grown footsore and weary long ere the end of his journey that long white road under the broiling sun those changeless hedges that pitiless burning sky become an affliction hardly to be borne in this sudden failure of happiness and hope it was not unnatural that elizabeth's eyes should turn with some kind of longing to the dazzling prospect perpetually exhibited to them by aunt chevenix remember my dearest lizzie wrote that lady whose longest epistles were always addressed to elizabeth remember that you have a great future before you and pray do not suffer yourself to be depressed by any remarks which envy or malice might dictate to those who feel themselves your inferiors in accomplishments and personal appearance your fate is in your own hands my dearest girl and it is you alone who can hinder by a foolish preference of which i cannot think with common patience can hinder the very high advancement which i feel assured fortune holds in reserve for you but i venture to believe that your absurd admiration of mr f is a thing of the past think my love of the delight you would feel in being mistress of a brilliant establishment in finding yourself the centre of an aristocratic and fashionable circle invited to state balls and royal garden parties <laughs> and then contrast this picture with the vision of some obscure parsonage its sunday school its old women in black bonnets that species of black bonnet which i imagine must be a natural product of the soil in agricultural districts so inevitable is its appearance and i can hardly believe there are people still living who would voluntarily make a thing of that shape 
look upon this picture my dearest girl and then on that as pope or some other old-fashioned writer has observed and let reason be your guide easter i am pleased to see falls early this year by which means we shall have done with lent before the fine weather begins i shall expect you as soon after easter sunday as your papa can manage to bring you to this visit she looked forward as a release from that life which had of late become worse than bondage but even in this looking forward there was an element of despair she might have balls and garden parties and pleasures without number she might wear fine dresses and sun her beauty in the light of admiring eyes but she would see malcolm ford no more would it not be happier for her to be thus divided than to see him day by day and every day become more assured of his indifference yes she told herself and in that whirlpool of london life was it likely she would be for ever haunted by his image it's this mariana in the moated grange kind of life that's killing me she said to herself as she sat by her turret window preferring her fireless bedroom to the society of her sisters watching the winter rain fall slowly in the drenched garden and the dripping sundial by which she had stood so often talking to malcolm ford in the summer that was gone it was arranged that mr luttrell and his third daughter should go to london on the thirtieth of march the vicar treating himself to a week's holiday in town after the fatigue of the easter services a burden which was chiefly borne by the broad shoulders of malcolm ford toward the end of february therefore elizabeth was able to occupy herself with the pleasing task of preparing for the visit a business which involved a good deal of dressmaking and a greater outlay than the vicar approved he grumbled and endured however as he had grumbled and endured when gertrude and diana spread their young pinions for their brief flight into those fashionable skies it seems a nonsensical waste of money he said with a doleful sigh as he wrote a final clearing up cheque for the hawley dressmaker and i don't suppose that your visit will result in anything more than your sister's visits but maria would lead me a life if i refused to let you go i beg your pardon papa exclaimed gertrude pray do not make any comparison between elizabeth and us she belongs to quite a different order of being and is sure to make a brilliant match it's not to be supposed that the world can overlook her merits i don't know about that said the vicar with a rueful glance at the figures on his cheque but this seems a large amount to pay for dressmaking i think girls in your position the daughters of a professional man ought to make your own gowns oh the bill isn't all for dressmaking papa miss march has found the material said elizabeth waving the question of what a girl in her position ought or ought not to do the trimmings are rather expensive perhaps but dresses are so much trimmed nowadays yes that's what i hear on every side when i complain of my bills replied the vicar butcher's meat is so much dearer nowadays says the cook fodder has risen since last month says the groom russia is consuming our coals and prices are mounting daily says the coal merchant but unhappily my income is not so elastic that is a fixed quantity and i fear the time is at hand when to make that square with our necessities will be something like attempting to square the circle the luttrell girls were accustomed to mild wailings of this kind when the paternal cheque-book had to be produced and cheques were signed as reluctantly as if they had been death warrants waiting for the sign manual of a tender-hearted king so they were not deeply impressed by this threat of future destitution they gave their minds very cheerfully to the preparation of their summer clothing envied elizabeth those extra garments provided for her approaching visit quarrelled and made friends again after the manner of sisters whose affection is tempered by certain individual failings frivolous as the distraction might be this choosing of colours and materials and trying on of new apparel served to brighten the bleak days of a blusterous march with a feeble light elizabeth thought just a little less of her hopeless wasted love 
while miss march's head apprentice was coming to the vicarage every day with patterns of gimps and fringes and laces and ruchings for the selection whereof all the sisters had to be convened like a synod even gertrude and diana were not altogether ill-natured and gave themselves up to these deliberations with a friendly air while blanche flung herself into the subject with youthful ardour and wound up her approval of every article by the declaration that she would have one like it when she went to aunt chevenix for her london season or perhaps you will be married and have a town house lizzie and i shall come to you which would be much nicer than being under auntie's thumb and of course you'd enjoy bringing out a younger sister viscountess paulyn on her marriage by lucretia viscountess paulyn miss blanche lutterell by her sister viscountess paulyn wouldn't that look well in the local papers End of chapter eleven book one chapter twelve of strangers and pilgrims by mary elizabeth braddon this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Strangers and Pilgrims, Chapter 12 A man can have but one life and one death, one heaven, one hell. Let me fulfil my fate, grant me my heaven now. Let me know you mine, prove you mine, write my name upon your brow, hold you and have you, and then die away, if God please, with completion in my soul mr ford's letters brought a more definite response than he had looked for one of the chief members of the society for the propagation of the gospel wrote strongly urging him to lend himself to that vast work it was just such men as he who were wanted and the need for such was great a new mission to a land of more than cimmerian darkness was on foot the harvest was ready had long been waiting for the sickle but fitting labourers were few the letter was long and eloquent and went home to malcolm ford's heart from the first from that first hour in which the slumbering depths of his spirit had been stirred with the sudden rush of religious enthusiasm like that strange ruffling of siloam's still waters beneath the breath of god's angel from that initial hour in which beside the clay-cold corpse of her who should have been his wife he dedicated his life to the service of his god he had meant to do something to make a name which should mark him out from the unnoted ranks of the church to accomplish a work which should be in itself the noblest monument that he could raise to the memory of his lost bride not in a quiet country parish could he find the fullness of his desires it was something to have made a ripple upon this stagnant pool something to have stirred the foul scum of indifference that had defiled these tideless waters but having done this successfully having awakened new life and vigour in this slumberous flock he began to think in all earnestness that it was time for him to be moving forward the life here was in no manner unpleasing to him it was sweet rather sweet in its utter peacefulness and the fruition of all his present desires he knew himself beloved and honoured knew himself to have acquired unwittingly the first place and not the second in the hearts and minds of this congregation but all this was not enough to the man who had made st paul his typical churchman to the man who had boasted of himself as a soldier and servant of christ very sweet was this pleasant resting place very dear the affection that greeted him on every side the blushing cheeks and reverent eyes of school children lifted to him as he went along the quiet street the warm praises of men and women the genial welcome that greeted him in every household the hush expectancy and upward look of rapt attention that marked his entrance to the pulpit but precious though these things might be to him they were not the accomplishment of his mission it was as a pilgrim he had entered the church a teacher whose influence for good could not be used in too wide a field not in this smooth garden ground could he find room for his labour his soul yearned for the pathless forest to stand with the pioneer's axe on his shoulder alone in the primeval wilderness with a new world to conquer a new race of men to gather into the fold of christ this having been in his thoughts from the very first a desire that had mingled with his dreams sleeping and waking from the beginning 
it would have been curiously inconsistent had he shrunk from its realisation now and yet he sat for a long time with that letter in his hand deliberating with a painful perplexity on the course which he should take nor did that lengthy reverie make an end of his deliberation he who had been wont to decide all things swiftly his life-path being so narrow a thread leading straight to one given point his scheme of existence hardly allowing room for irresolution was now utterly at fault tossed upon a sea of doubt perplexed beyond measure alas almost unawares that mathematically adjusted scheme of his existence had fallen out of gear the wheels were clogged that had gone so smoothly the machine no longer worked with that even swiftness which had made his life so easy he was no longer able to concentrate all his thoughts and desires upon one point but was dragged to this side and to that by contending influences in a word he had given himself to a new idol that idea of foreign service of toiling for his master in an untrodden world of being able to say this work is mine and mine only which a little while ago had been to him so exhilarating a notion had now lost its charm never to see her any more he said to himself not even to know her fate could i endure that oh i know but too well that she is not worthy of my love that she is not worthy to divide my heart with the service of my god not worthy that for her sake i should be false to the vow that i made beside alice fraser's deathbed and yet i cannot tear my heart away from her sometimes i say to myself that this is not love at all only a base earthly passion a slavish worship of her beauty sometimes i half believe that i never truly loved before that my affection for alice was only a sublimated friendship that the true passion is this and this only he thought of david and that fatal hour in which the king of israel the chosen of the lord walked alone upon the housetop and beheld the woman whose beauty was to be his ruin thought and wondered at that strange solemn story with its pathetic ending was he stronger or wiser than david when for the magic of a lovely face he was ready to give his soul into bondage for three days and three nights he abandoned himself to the demon of uncertainty for three days and three nights he wrestled with the devil and satan came to him in but two fairer guise wearing the shape of the woman he loved in the end he conquered or believed that he had conquered there was no immediate necessity for a decisive reply to that letter but he determined to accept the mission that had been offered him and he began to make his arrangements with that view having once made up his mind as to his future it was of course his duty to communicate that fact to the vicar without loss of time so upon the first evening that he found himself at liberty he walked out to the vicarage to make this announcement it was an evening in the middle of march grey and cold but calm withal for the blusterous winds had spent their fury in the morning and there was only a distant mysterious sound of fitful gusts sweeping across the moorland ever and anon like the sighing of a discontented titan there was a dim line of primrose light still lingering behind the western edge of the hills when malcolm ford passed under the bar and out into the open country that lay beyond that ancient archway he looked at the dim grey landscape with a sudden touch of sadness how often had his eyes looked upon those familiar things without seeing them the time might soon come when to remember this place in its quiet english beauty would be positive pain just as it had been pain to him sometimes in this place to recall the mountains and the locks of his native land if i could but have lived here all the days of my life with elizabeth for my fellow-worker and companion he thought i can conceive no existence happier than that if i could be satisfied with small things but for a man who has set all his hopes on something higher surely that would be a living death i should be stifled in the languid sweetness of such an atmosphere he thought of himself with a wife and children his heart and mind filled with care for that dear household 
all his desires all his hopes all his fears converging to that one centre only the remnant of his intellectual power left for the service of his god a man cannot serve two masters he said to himself sweet fancy sweet dream of wife and home i renounce you there are men enough in this world with the capacity for happiness the men who are most needed are the men who can do without it the curate stood for some moments before the vicarage gate with a thoughtful air but instead of opening it walked slowly on along the waste borderland of unkempt turf that edged the high road just at the last moment that new habit of indecision took hold of him again he had hardly made up his mind what to say he would find mr luttrell with his daughters round him most likely elizabeth's clear eyes would peruse his face while he pronounced his sentence of banishment he was not quite prepared for this interview and strolled on meditatively in the cold grey twilight wondering at his own unlikeness to himself will she be sorry he wondered just a little grieved to see me depart out of her life for ever i remember when i spoke of my missionary schemes that day i told her the story of my life there was a shocked look in her face as if the idea were dreadful to her and then she began to talk of missionaries with the air of a schoolgirl as a low sort of people she is such an unanswerable enigma at times deluding one into a belief in her soul's nobility at other times showing herself frivolous shallow empty in brain and heart and yet i think after her own light fashion she will be sorry for my going then arose before him the image of lord paulyn and the memory of that sunday luncheon at the vicarage the two faces turned toward each other the man's face ardent and enraptured the girl's glowing with a conscious pride in its loveliness two faces that were of the earth earthy a brief scene which seemed like the prelude of a drama wherein he malcolm ford could have no part he bethought himself of that mere fragment of conversation he had overheard unawares on the threshold of the vestry a gush of girlish confidence in which elizabeth had boldly spoken of the viscount as her slave he remembered that common talk in which the hawley gossips had coupled lord paulyn's name with elizabeth luttrell's and he thought with a pang that this was perhaps the future which awaited her he thought of such a prospect with more than common pain a pain in which selfish regret or jealousy had no part he had heard enough of lord paulyn's career to know that the woman who married him would prepare for herself a doubtful future in all likelihood a dark and stormy one if i can get a minute's talk alone with her before i leave this place i will warn her he said to himself oh heaven knows if her heart is set on this business she is little likely to accept my warning he wasted half an hour idling thus by the wayside and in all that time had been thinking wholly of elizabeth instead of pondering on what he should say to her father but about that there need be no difficulty he had never yet found himself at a loss for words and though mr luttrell would doubtless be reluctant to lose so energetic a coadjutor his affliction would hardly be overwhelming there was always a fair supply of curates in the ecclesiastical market of various qualities indeed the supply of this article was apt to be in excess of the demand it was past seven when mr ford entered the vicarage the six o'clock dinner was fairly over the lamp lighted in the long low ceiling drawing-room the four girls grouped around the fire in their favourite attitudes elizabeth on her knees before the blaze gazing into the heart of the fire like a prophetess intent on reading auguries in the coals she started to her feet when the servant announced mr ford but did not leave the hearth to greet him though her three sisters crowded eagerly about him to give him a reproachful welcome it is such an age since you have been near us said gertrude almost piteously i cannot think what we have done to offend you oh you must know that i have had no possible reason for being offended dear miss luttrell he answered cordially but with his glance wandering uneasily towards that other figure rooted to the hearth your house is only too pleasant and i have had very little time for pleasure 
i see your papa elsewhere and to come here is only another name for giving myself a holiday gertrude cast up her eyes in a kind of ecstasy what a saint you are she exclaimed and what a privilege to feel your blessed influence guiding and directing one's feeble efforts i have felt myself almost miraculously assisted in my poor work since you have been with us and i look back and remember my previous coldness with a shudder i have no consciousness of my saintship said mr ford with a little good-natured laugh making very light of an elderly young ladylike worship to which he was tolerably accustomed on the contrary i have a strong sense of being very human but i am glad if i have been the source of enthusiasm in you and trust that when i am no longer here to guide or inspire quite unconsciously again you will not be in any danger of falling away but i do not fear that contingency this with a somewhat severe glance in the direction of that figure by the hearth for i believe that you are thoroughly in earnest there is no such thing as earnestness without constancy elizabeth took up the challenge and flashed defiance upon the challenger oh gertrude was born good she said i wonder papa took the trouble to christen her it's impossible that she could have been born in sin and a child of wrath like the rest of us she's never tired of church going and district visiting she has no intermittent fever of wickedness as i have when you are no longer here dear mr ford cried gertrude deaf to her sister's sneers with her hands clasped and her somewhat faded grey eyes opened very wide and gazing at the curate with a wild surmise you surely do not mean you're thinking of leaving us i have been nearly two years at hawley he answered quietly longer than i intended to remain when i first came here two very happy years but i have awakened lately to the conviction that hawley is not all the world only a very pleasant corner of it and that if i stamp my name upon nothing larger than a country parish i shall scarcely have realised the idea with which i entered the church you've been offered a church in london perhaps gasped gertrude dolefully diana and blanche had seated themselves and watched the little scene with a sympathetic air regretful but not despairing they would be very sorry to lose mr ford who was tall and good-looking and gentlemanlike and had money of his own but perhaps the vast ocean of curates might cast up at their feet even a more attractive specimen of that order a man better adapted for picnics and small tea drinkings and croquet you're going out as a missionary cried elizabeth with conviction they all turned to look at her startled by the certainty of her tone she hadn't stirred from her position by the hearth but stood there confronting them calm as a statue a curious contrast to the distressed gertrude who was wringing her hands feebly and gazing at the curate with a half distracted air the single lamp stood on a distant table but even in the doubtful light mr ford fancied that elizabeth's face had grown suddenly pale you are going out as a missionary she repeated as if she had by some subtle power of sympathy shared all his thoughts from the hour in which he briefly touched upon his views in his one confidential talk with her you are good at guessing he said yes i am going oh cried gertrude it is like your apostolic nature to contemplate such self-sacrifice but oh dear mr ford consider your health and the natives i don't think st paul ever gave much consideration to his health or the question of possible danger from the natives answered mr ford with his grave smile and if you insist upon comparing me with saints and apostles you would at least expect me to be as regardless of any peril to myself as the numerous gentlemen who have spent the best part of their lives in this work those lives might not have been so precious as yours mr ford or they may have been much more precious there are very few to regret me should the chances of war be adverse again he stole a glance at elizabeth she stood firm as a rock and was now not even looking his way 
her eyes were bent upon the decaying fire with that customary prophetic look she might have been trying to read his fate there however he continued the die is cast i have arrived at the conviction that i am more wanted yonder to dig and delve that rugged soil than to idle among the delights of this flower-garden and i came here this evening to announce my determination to mr luttrell do you know if i shall find him in his study papa has gone into town to the reading-room said blanche ah then i can take my chance of finding him there said the curate preparing to depart oh mr ford how unkind to be so anxious to run away when this is perhaps almost your last visit you must stop to tea and you can tell us about your plans uh, how soon with a little choking noise you really mean to leave us i will stop with much pleasure if you like he answered putting down his hat which gertrude took up with a reverent air as if it had been a mitre and removed to a convenient abiding-place as to my plans they are somewhat vague as yet i have little to tell beyond the one fact that i am going only i thought it due to mr luttrell to give him the earliest information of that fact insignificant as it may be it is not insignificant exclaimed gertrude hawley never had such a gain or such a loss as you will have been to it will it be with another little choking interval like a strangled semicolon very long before we lose you i do not know what you call long or about a month perhaps only a month only four more blessed sundays oh mr ford that is sudden do not suppose that i am not sorry to go said mr ford i am very fond of hawley but that other work is a part of an old design i have only been trying my strength here only fluttering your wings like a young eagle before soaring to the topmost mountain peaks exclaimed gertrude with a little gush of poetry raising her tearful eyes to the ceiling in the midst of which burst the maid brought in the tea-tray and miss luttrell seated herself to perform her duties in connection therewith not without a consolatory pride in the silver tea-service she was the kind of woman to whom even in the hour of despair these things are not utterly dust and ashes elizabeth had seated herself in an armchair by the fire on which her gaze was still gravely bent she made no farther attempt to join in the conversation but sat silent while gertrude persecuted the curate with questions about his future career not consenting to be put off with vague or careless answers but evincing an insatiable thirst for exact information upon every point scarcely did elizabeth lift her eyes from that mute contemplation of the fire when mr ford carried her a cup of tea she took it from him with a murmured acknowledgment but did not look up at him or give him any excuse for lingering near her he was obliged to go back to his chair by the round table at the other end of the room and sit in the full glare of the lamp submitting himself meekly to gertrude's cross-questioning he bore this inflection perhaps with a greater patience than he might otherwise have shown for the sake of that quiet figure by the hearth against his better judgment even although the plan of his life was fixed irrevocably and elizabeth luttrell's image excluded from it there was yet a pensive sweetness in her presence her silent presence the sense of being near her what does it matter if the pleasure is a foolish one he thought it must needs be so brief he stayed about an hour sipping orange pekoe and talking somewhat reluctantly of his hopes and views for he was a man who deemed that in these things silence is golden he tried to turn the thread of talk another way but gertrude would not be put off oh let us talk of you and your future dear mr ford she exclaimed with her accustomed air of pious rapture it will be such a comfort when you are gone to be able to think of you and follow your footsteps on the map the clock struck the half hour after nine and mr luttrell had not yet appeared so the curate rose to depart and went across to the hearthrug to bid elizabeth good-night oh you'd better say good-bye at the same time said diana 
your visits are so few and far between that i dare say lizzie will have gone away before we see you again gone away oh yes she's going to town in a fortnight to stay with aunt chevenix indeed this in a disappointed tone yet it could matter so little to him whither she went when he was about to disconnect himself altogether from hawley only he disapproved of aunt chevenix in the abstract and it was disagreeable to him to hear that the woman he had admired and at times even believed in was about to be subject to her influence i believe that you are half a puritan at heart mr ford said diana and that you look upon all fashionable pleasures as criminal i could read it in your face one day when auntie was holding forth upon her delectable land in the regions of eaton place i have no passion for that kind of thing i admit answered the curate but i trust that your sister elizabeth will pass safely through that and every other ordeal if good wishes could ensure her safety mine are earnest enough to count for something he shook hands with elizabeth as he said this the hand she gave him was very cold and he fancied even that it trembled a little as his strong fingers closed on it then followed gertrude's effusive farewells he would come to see them oftener would he not now that his hours among them were numbered diana and blanche were also effusive but in a milder degree having already been speculating upon the possible attributes of a new curate in so dull a life as theirs even the agony of such a parting was not unpleasing distraction like that abscess in the cheek from which an austrian archduchess derived amusement in her declining years while these farewells were being somewhat lengthily drawn out elizabeth slipped quietly from the room mr ford heard the flutter of her dress and looked round for a moment to discover that her place was vacant how empty did the room seem to him without her he dragged himself away from the reluctant gertrude at last and felt not a little relieved when he found himself in the open air under a windy sky the moon shining fitfully with swift clouds scudding across her silvern face the night winds sighing among the laurels on the leafy bank that shadowed the almost empty flower border where a fringe of daffodils showed pale in the moonlight mr ford walked slowly towards the gate over the lawn on which he had condescended to foolish games of croquet in the summers that were gone thinking of elizabeth and her curious apathetic silence and the almost death-like coldness of the hand that touched his she is the strangest girl he said to himself and there are moments when i'm half tempted to think he didn't finish the thought even to himself for looking up suddenly he beheld a figure standing before him on the edge of the lawn a woman's figure with a shawl of fleecy whiteness folded arab-wise and shrouding it almost from head to feet yet even thus muffled he knew the figure by its bearing a loftier air than is common to modern young ladyhood something nearer akin to the untutored grace of an indian princess elizabeth yes mr ford i've come out here to ask you if it is true if you do really intend to fling your life away like that there is no question of my flinging away my life he answered quietly yet strangely moved by her presence by the smothered passion in her tone i shall be as much in the hands of god yonder as i am here oh of course she answered in her reckless way god is with us everywhere watching and judging us but he suffers human sacrifices even in our day it may be in the scheme of providence that you should be eaten or scalped or tomahawked or burnt alive by savages be sure that if it is the thing will happen oh that's your horrible calvinistic doctrine almost as bad as a turk's but if you do not leave england you cannot fall into the hands of those dreadful savages <laughs> and perhaps remain at home to be killed in a railway accident or die of smallpox i hardly think the savages would be worse and if i felt i'd done any good among them there would be a kind of glory in my death which might take the sting out of its physical pain the path of glory leads but to the grave quoted elizabeth gloomily oh, don't go mr ford there are heathens enough to convert in england 
but I feel that my vocation calls me yonder. It's a mere fancy. You were a soldier the other day, and cannot forget the old longing for foreign service. Believe me, no. I have considered this business with more deliberation than is usual to me, and I am quite convinced that my duty lies in that direction. A delusion! You would be greater and more useful in England. Your countryman Edward Irving had once that fancy, I remember. He had his ideal picture of a missionary's life, and seriously thought of trying to realise it. Better for himself, perhaps, if he had achieved that early aim, than to be a world's wonder for a few brief years, and die the dupe of a disordered brain. Don't go, Mr. Ford, clasping her hands and looking up at him so piteously with her lovely eyes, so different from the seraphic gaze of poor Gertrude's faded orbs. I wish to heaven I were eloquent, and knew how to plead and argue, as some people do. You are only too eloquent. Your words go to my heart. For God's sake, say no more. Oh, yes, yes, I will say much more. If I can touch you, if my words can penetrate your obstinate heart, you shall not go. I'm pleading for Hawley, and all the people who love you, who have drawn their very faith and hope from you, as if your soul were a fountain of righteousness. I have a presentiment that if you go to those savage islands, it will be to perish, to lose your life for a vain dream. Stay here and teach us to be good. We were half of us pagans till you came to us. They had walked on toward the gate while they were talking. They stood now close beside it, Elizabeth with one bare hand clasping the topmost bar, as if she meant to hinder the curate's exit till she had extorted the recantation of his vow. There was a little pause after her last speech. Malcolm Ford stood looking downward, thinking of what she had said, thinking of it with a passionate delight which was new and strange to his soul, a rapture which had been no element in his love of Alice Fraser. Suddenly he took the hand that hung loosely by Elizabeth's side. If I were weak enough, mad enough to prefer my own happiness to the call of duty, I should stay here, he said. You ought to know that. I know nothing, except you've been very hard and cruel to me always, in spite of all my feeble endeavours to please you, answered the girl, with a faint touch of the pettishness common to the undisciplined beauty. Your endeavours to please me, he repeated. Could I think you valued my opinion? If I had imagined that, if I could have supposed for one presumptuous moment that you loved me. If you could have supposed, she cried impatiently, you must have known that I loved you, that I have hated myself for loving you, and that I hated you for not loving me. No swift answer came from his lips, but she was clasped in his arms, held close against his heart, his passionate heart, which had never beaten thus until this moment. "'My darling, my darling,' he said at last, in the lowest, fondest tones that ever stole from a lover's lips, "'I never knew what passionate love meant till I knew you.' "'Not when you loved Alice Fraser?' she asked doubtfully. "'Not even for my sweet Alice.' I loved her because she was as good as she was beautiful, because to love her seemed the nearest way to heaven. I love you even when you seem to lead me away from heaven. Because I'm so wicked, she said with a shade of bitterness. No, darling, only because you are not utterly perfect, because to love you is to be too fond of this sweet world, to be less eager for heaven. Oh, my dear. Dearest, what a slave you can make of me. But beware of this passionate love which you have kindled in a heart that tried so hard to shut you out. It is jealous and exacting, tyrannic, perilous, perilous for you and for me. It is of the earth and earthy. I love you too much for the sake of your beauty, too much for the magic of those lovely eyes that seem sweeter to me than summer starlight. And if something were to happen to me that would spoil my good looks forever, you'd leave off loving me, I suppose, she said. Oh, no, dearest, you would still be Elizabeth. 
there's a nameless indefinable charm which would be left even if your beauty had perished then you do not love me for the sake of my beauty she asked persistently as if she were bent on plucking out the heart of his mystery well, not now perhaps but i fear it was that which won me i never meant to love you remember elizabeth no battle was ever harder fought than mine against my own heart and you nor ever a battle lost more ignominiously he added with a faint sigh well, thank heaven it is lost she said not for my sake i will not claim so unwilling a victim but for your own you will not go to the antipodes to be eaten by savages not if you offer me the supremest earthly happiness at home i will try to do some good in my generation and yet be happy i will forget that i ever had any higher aspiration than to tread the beaten tracks i will try to be useful in my small way at home this half regretfully even with her bright head resting on his shoulder and her lovely eyes looking up at him with an almost worshipping fondness and you will help me to lead a good life will you not elizabeth he asked earnestly i will be your slave she said with a strange blending of scorn and pride scorn of herself intensest pride in him i'll be your dog to fetch and carry the veriest drudge in your parish work if you like i can fancy our life in the dreariest parsonage that ever was built a wild waste of marsh and fen round about us a bleak straggling street of hovels for our town not a decent habitation within ten miles of us only the poor with their perpetual wants and ailments and afflictions i can fancy all this and yet my life will be spent in paradise with you sweet fooling in which lovers delight doubly sweet to malcolm ford to whom it was so new my dearest and best he said smiling at her enthusiasm i will forgive you the marshes and fens that is to say we will not go out of our way to find them but we will go wherever we are most wanted to a nice manufacturing town for instance where there'll be a perpetual odour of soap boiling and size making and soot blowing in at all our windows Oh, perhaps to such a town darling but i would find you a nest beyond the odours of soap boiling or if you have set your heart on a mission to the dog rib indians or the maoris or the japanese i will go with you why should i have less courage than that noble creature lady baker indeed on reflection i think i should rather like such an adventurous existence if one could go about in a yacht now and convert the heathen it would be really nice i will not risk a life so precious to me no dearest we will be content with a narrower sphere after all perhaps a clergyman who has a wife may be of much more use than a bachelor in an english parish she can be a valuable ally if she chooses almost a second self i will choose to be anything that you order me to be she answered confidently Oh, but oh my darling are you really in earnest he asked in his gravest tone scrutinising the upturned face with a serious searching gaze for pity's sake elizabeth do not fool me you have told me that you are fitful and inconstant if if this love which fills my soul with such a fond delight which changes the whole scheme of my existence in a moment if on your part it's only a brief fancy born perhaps of the very idleness and emptiness of your life let us forget every word we've said you can trust me darling i shall not think less of you for being self-deluded consider in time whether it's possible for you to change whether the kind of life which you speak of so lightly would not really seem dismal and unendurable to you when you found yourself pledged to go on living it to the end of your days whether there is not in your heart some hankering for worldly pleasures and worldly triumphs a longing which might grow into a regret when you had lost all hope of them for ever to marry me is to accept a life that must be lived chiefly for others my wife must be a lay sister of charity 
"'Have I not told you that I'll be your slave?' she answered, and then, withdrawing herself suddenly from his arms, "'Oh, I begin to understand,' she said with a deeply wounded air. "'It is I who have been offering myself to you, not you to me, and you are trying to find a polite mode of rejection. Why are you not more candid? Why not humiliate me at once by saying, "'Really, Miss Luttrell, your readiness to sacrifice yourself is most obliging. Only I do not happen to want you.' "'Elizabeth, you know that I love you with all my heart and mind.' "'Do you? No, I cannot believe it. I have wished it too much. No one ever obtained anything so ardently wished for. It's not in nature that I should be so happy.' "'If there is any happiness in being assured of my love, drink the draught freely. It is and has been yours almost since the beginning of our acquaintance.' "'There's more than happiness. There's intoxication,' she answered in her fervent, unmeasured fashion. "'Not because you're handsome,' she went on with an arch smile, "'for in that respect I am superior to you. It was not your face that won me.' I love you because you seem to me so much above all other men, because you have dominion over me, in fact. I did not think it could be so sweet to have a master. Oh, say rather, a guide and counsellor, dearest. There shall be no question of dominion between us. I want your life to be as happy as mine will be in the possession of your love. Oh, but I insist upon your being my master, she answered impetuously. I am not a creature to be guided or counselled. Oh, see how little influence papa has ever exercised over me with his mild bewailings and lamentings, or Gertrude with her everlasting sermonising. Believe me, I must be commanded by a being stronger than myself. Even my love for you is slavish. See how little value I could have set upon my dignity as a woman when I came out here tonight to make my supplication to you. But I did not mean to betray myself. I only meant to plead for the people of Hawley. You will not think me too contemptible, will you, Malcolm? The name was half whispered. It was the first time she'd ever pronounced it. Contemptible? A lingering kiss upon the broad white brow made the rest of his answer. How long this kind of talk might have lasted is an open question. But at this moment Elizabeth's quick ear caught the sound of a footstep on the high road. "'It is Papa, perhaps,' she said nervously. Oh, "'Please go.' Oh, "'If you wish it, darling. But I may tell him everything tomorrow, may I not?' "'Tomorrow? Oh, that is so very sudden.' "'There can be no reason for delay, dearest. Of course our marriage is an event in the future. I am not going to hasten that unduly.' though as far as worldly matters go i am in a position to marry to-morrow but there should be no delay in letting your father know of our engagement i suppose not our engagement how strange that sounds do you really mean it or will you write me a little note to-morrow morning recalling your ill-advised expressions of to-night well, such a note is more likely to come from you than from me but one word, darling. How about this visit to Mrs. Chevenix? It can be put off, can it not, now? Oh, I hardly think so. Auntie has made all preparations for me. Well, they cannot involve much. Oh, she would be so disappointed, and Papa so angry. And there are my expectations, you know. One cannot fly in the face of fortune. My wife must be independent of expectations, dear, and London gaieties are not the best preparation for life in a parsonage among the fens. Do you think not? I shall find out how hollow and empty such pleasures are, and learn to despise them. That is according to circumstances, but as a matter of personal feeling, I would rather you did not go." I only wish it were possible to slip out of the engagement. Oh, but I don't think it is. Aunt Chevenix is so easily offended. Offend her then, dear, for once in the way. Elizabeth shook her head hopelessly. After the money that had been spent upon her dresses, it would seem something worse than folly not to wear them. 
they might have served for her trousseau perhaps but she doubted if so much flouncing and trimming on the garments of a country clergyman's wife would have satisfied malcolm ford's sense of the fitness of things there was a white tulle ball dress dotted about with tea roses a masterpiece of miss march's which she thought of with a tender regretfulness oh the dresses ought really to be worn and what a pity to offend aunt chevenix for nothing very well said mr ford i see my tyranny is not to begin yet a while if you must go dear you must but it seems rather hard that our betrothal should be inaugurated by a separation it will only be for a few weeks and i am not going till the end of the month the footstep had approached and had passed the vicarage gate it was not the step of mr luttrell but of some bulky farmer walking briskly toward his homestead good night dearest said malcolm ford suddenly awakened to the recollection that it was a cold march night and that elizabeth was beginning to shiver how inconsiderate of me to keep you standing in the open air so long shall i take you back to the hall door oh no my sisters might see us and wonder i will run round by the orchard and go in the back way very well dear they shall have no ground for wonderment after to-morrow good night End of chapter 12book one chapter thirteen of strangers and pilgrims by mary elizabeth braddon this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org strangers and pilgrims chapter thirteen for destiny does not like to yield to men the helm and shoots his thoughts by hidden nerves throughout the solid realm the patient demon sits with roses and a shroud he has his way and deals his gifts but ours is not allowed very little slumber came to the eyelids of elizabeth that night she had spent many a sleepless night of late nights of tossing to and fro and weary longing for the late coming dawn nights full of thought and wonder about the dim strange future and what it held for her nights full of visions of triumphs and pleasures to come or of sad longing for one dearer delight which was never to be hers the love of that one man whom she loved very different were her thoughts and visions to-night he loved her the one unspeakable blessing which she had for a long time deemed unattainable had dropped into her lap he loved her and she had given herself to him for ever and ever no more vague dreams of the triumphs that were to be won by her beauty no more half childish imaginings of pleasures and glories awaiting her in the world she knew not on the very threshold of that dazzling region just when success seemed certainty love closed the gate and she was to remain without in the bleaker drearier world she knew brightened only by that dear companionship she had told him that the most dismal home to which he could take her would be a paradise if shared with him and she believed that it would be so yet being a creature made up of opposites she could not let the old dream go without a pang from my very childhood i fancied that something wonderful would happen to me something as brilliant and unexpected as the fate of cinderella and it all ends by my marrying a curate she said to herself half wonderingly but then he is not like the common herd of curates he is not like the common herd of mankind it's an honour to worship him and then by and by she thought i wish i had been a russian empress and he my serf what a delight to have chosen him from his base-born brotherhood and placed him beside me on the throne to have recognised all that makes him noble in spite of his surroundings to have been able to say i give you my heart and soul and all this northern world an empress could afford to make a bad match it was a bad match even with all the glamour of this new delight upon her she did not attempt to disguise this fact i am glad he has money of his own she mused we can at least have a nicely furnished house 
what a comfort to have modern furniture after our ancient rubbish and silver like papa's and i dare say malcolm will give me money enough to dress nicely in a simple parson's wifeish way i shall have to work very hard in his parish of course but it will be for his sake and that will sweeten everything she thought of lord paulyn and smiled to herself at the idea of his disappointment now that she had plighted her faith to some one else she felt very sure that the viscount had been desperately in love with her and had only waited with the insolence of rank and wealth his own good time for telling her of his love it would be not unamusing if she met him in london to lead him on a little to the point of an offer even and then crush him by the information that she was engaged and it would be still more agreeable some day in the happy future when she was malcolm ford's wife to tell her husband how she had refused a coronet for his sake she remembered that foolish wager of her pearl necklace diana was welcome to the bauble and even to any touch of spiteful triumph which she might feel in her sister's acceptance of so humble a destiny but they can hardly crow over me if lord paulyn makes me an offer and i refuse him she said to herself was she not utterly happy in the first flush of her victory having won the thing she had longed for almost utterly perhaps but even with the intoxication of that delight there was mingled a vague notion that she had been foolish that the world her own small world would laugh at her she had carried her head so high and protested not once but a hundred times that come what might she would never throw herself away upon a curate what a storm of anger and ridicule must she needs encounter from mrs chevenix whenever that worldly wide matron should be informed of her infatuated conduct that defiant spirit which so often had flouted the chevenix quailed and shrunk to-night at the thought of the stormy scene that was likely to follow such a revelation but surely i am the mistress of myself she thought it is myself i am giving away and papa is not up to his eyes in debt or in danger of dying in a workhouse unless i make a rich marriage and if i am a little better looking than my sisters and the sort of girl people say ought to make a success in life is that any reason why i should not be happy my own way unutterably happy with the man i love so dearly and to be loved by whom is like the beginning of a new life it will be seen therefore that even in the hour of victory elizabeth was not unconscious of having thrown herself away she had been miserable without mr ford's love but she was quite aware of the price her devotion to him was to cost her the phantasmal opera box and town house and country seats and carriages and saddle horses faded slowly from before her eyes like a ghostly procession of this world's brightest glories melting for ever into shadowland the worldly half of her soul suffered a pang at parting with these pomps and vanities they do not constitute happiness i know she reflected but i have thought of them so long as part of my future life that it does seem just a little difficult to imagine the future without them and then she remembered the dark eyes looking down at hers the grave low voice speaking words of love sweeter words than she had ever thought to hear from the lips of malcolm ford she remembered these things and the pomps and vanities seemed as nothing when weighed against them thank god that he loves me she said to herself what do i care if other people are disappointed or malicious i will be happy my own way in spite of this resolution she felt strangely nervous next morning at breakfast when she met the family circle about which there seemed somehow to be a lurking air of suspicion though nobody could have reason to suspect she had slipped quietly in from her nocturnal excursion and had gone up to her own room unobserved when she sent a message to the drawing-room by one of the servants to the effect that she had a headache and could not come down to prayers i hope your headache's gone said diana with the lukewarm solicitude of a relative oh thanks uh, yes i think so a headache is scarcely a subject for thought remarked gertrude 
one has or one has not a headache there are such things as nervous headaches said elizabeth carelessly which i have always regarded as another name for affectation replied gertrude but you're not eating a crumb of anything lizzie exclaimed blanche and you're so pale and have such a heavy look about the eyes i did not sleep much last night and as for breakfast i've always considered it a most uninviting meal perpetual eggs and rashers and dry toast and dundee marmalade oh, give me another cup of tea please gertie i am feverishly thirsty and i am sure if we are on the subject of looks i cannot congratulate you on your appearance this morning you look as if you've been crying half the night gertrude flushed crimson at this accusation i do not deny that mr ford's announcement of last night was a blow to me she said we have worked so long together and i had learned to look upon him almost as a brother elizabeth smiled to herself as she looked into her teacup she was wondering how gertrude would like to look upon him quite as a brother that is to say as a brother-in-law this idea of his going out as a missionary exclaimed blanche spreading marmalade on her bread and butter it sounds low church somehow to me i wonder what his successor will be like speculated diana good-looking and gentlemanlike i trust and not a horrid man with a herd of brats said the flippant blanche blanche i do not consider it consistent either with christian principles or the preservation of your health to put marmalade on your bread and butter to such an extent as you are doing said gertrude with a housekeeper's eye to waste i suppose we shall see no more of mr ford till just as he is going away and then perhaps we shall only get his card with p p c in the corner remarked diana listlessly she had already begun to put mr ford out of her mind as a thing of the past elizabeth smiled again with a bent head a happy triumphant smile the smile of a heart which held no regret for a possible coronet a heart which was filled to the very brim with a love for malcolm ford and a joyful pride for having won him she was thinking how soon they were likely to see him again and how often he was hers now her vassal yes he the saint the demigod had assumed an earthly bondage she had talked in her foolish childish rapture of being his slave but she meant to make him hers i wish i could get out of the visit to auntie as he wishes she thought if blanche could go in my place for instance but my dress wouldn't fit blanche and perhaps it would be as well for me to see the world a little before i bid good-bye to it drain the cup of pleasure to the dregs and find out how vapid the draught is this was an easy way of settling the question but the fact is that elizabeth luttrell having looked forward during the last four years to the unknown delights of a london season was hardly disposed to relinquish so much pleasure even for the sake of the man she loved better than all the rest of the world she was a girl who thought she had a right to obtain everything she wished for and even to serve two masters if she pleased she appeared unusually restless during the interval between breakfast and luncheon wandered out into the garden and orchard and came back to the house with her hair blown about by the bleak march wind sat down to the piano when that instrument was available and sang a little and played a little in her usual desultory manner took up a book from the table only to fling it down impatiently five minutes afterwards and every now and then went to the window and stood looking absently across the lawn one would suppose you expected somebody lizzie said diana you do fidget so abominably and stare out of the window so continually you may suppose it if you like has lord paulyn come back to ashcombe i know nothing of his lordship's movements oh indeed i thought he was about the only person in whom you were interested and i began to think you had received private intelligence and were on the watch for him i am not on the watch for him nor do i care if i never see him again oh what a change oh but how about your wager in that case my wager oh, what? 
pearl necklace you mean of course you knew that was the merest nonsense what are you going to back out of it i thought it was a serious challenge oh, take the necklace if you like i don't think i shall ever wear it and i have other things of poor mamma's but does that mean that you confess yourself beaten that you promised more than you feel yourself able to perform have it so if you like you put me in a passion that night and i said anything only to annoy you but i shall never be lord paulyn's wife what a death-blow for poor auntie she had set her heart upon having a niece in the peerage her debrette would have opened of its own accord like the book thackeray speaks of at the article paulyn <laughs> the sisters were dawdling over their luncheon when they heard a footstep on the gravel and anon a ring at the hall door blanche the agile dashed to a window in time to recognise the visitor now whoever do you suppose it is girls she cried just guess nobody appeared able to solve the enigma although elizabeth's fast-beating heart told her the visitor's name it's mr ford cried blanche he's come to tell papa no doubt said gertrude taking a hasty survey of the table to see that the midday meal made a respectable appearance and then going straightway to the dining-room door to intercept the visitor papa is in his study dear mr ford she said shaking hands with him oh, but do come in first and have a little luncheon blanche ring for some fresh cutlets no no thank you miss luttrell i never take any luncheon and i do particularly want to see the vicar but i told him everything and he is so grieved i don't think you can have told quite everything he answered with a stolen look at elizabeth who was standing just within the doorway and a little smile and i hope we shall be able to overcome his grief i will go to him at once and look in upon you young ladies in the drawing-room afterwards now remember we shall expect you said gertrude with her reverential air hardly sorry that he had been proof against the temptation of the hot cutlet which had been a somewhat speculative offer since there might or might not be a section of the best end of neck in reserve in the larder what delightful manners she said as she went back to her place at the table no assumption of goodness no consciousness of possessing a loftier nature than the common herd why you wouldn't have him stalking about in a surplice or expounding the scriptures on the doorstep would you gertie cried the irreverent blanche i don't see why sinners should be the only people with decent manners hold your tongue child you're incapable of understanding such a nature as his you can gaze upon that saintly brow without one thrill of emotion i certainly shouldn't offer mutton cutlets to people with saintly brows i have more sense of the fitness of things replied the uncrushable youngest elizabeth said nothing she was subject to long lapses of silence in the company of her sisters they were so little worth the trouble of conversation and now she had sweet thoughts that filled her mind while they were babbling a new wealth of happiness he had come to speak to her father to offer himself as her husband and afterwards he would come to the drawing-room and she would know the result suppose papa should reject him she thought with alarm i know how aunt chevenix preached to him about lord paulyn and the brilliant future before me but thank heaven papa is not mercenary so long as he is not disappointed in his dinners he is sure to take things easily the four girls repaired to the drawing-room soon after this and gertrude skirmished about the room making a clearance of litter books that had been flung down anywhere work-baskets overturned flying sheets of music and having done this seated herself at her own particular little table with its neatly kept dorcas basket and began to tear calico elizabeth subsided into her favourite chair by the fire and did nothing after her wont nothing except to look at the clock on the mantelpiece every now and then wondering how long the interview would last what a time they are blanche exclaimed at last with a yawn i should have thought as papa knew all about it they'd have made shorter work of the business 
if you would employ yourself blanche you would have less time for idle speculation of that kind said gertrude severely but the whole weight of the dorcas basket is allowed to fall on my shoulders that's the worst of being born too good for this world my dear gertie people are sure to impose upon you the door was opened at this moment and mr ford came in and crossed the room to elizabeth's place by the fire and planted himself on the hearthrug by her side towering above her as she sat in her low chair and looking down at her with a tender smile the sisters stared at him wonderingly there was an air of appropriation in the manner of his greeting grave and subdued as it was all has ended happily he said in a low voice as they shook hands you will meet with no opposition from your father have you told papa everything asked gertrude watching the two with jealous eyes everything and he is very sorry is he not oh a little disappointed perhaps but hardly sorry oh disappointed yes of course he had hoped you would stay with us at least three years how i wish he could have persuaded you to change your mind suppose i have changed my mind said mr ford smiling at her anxiety suppose i have found an influence powerful enough to make me forego my most cherished ambition i don't quite understand faltered gertrude looking from him to elizabeth with a blank dismayed look you seem to have made up your mind so completely last night what can have happened since then to make you waver wonderful things have happened to me since last night all my thoughts and dreams have undergone a revolution i have discovered that a life at home can be sweeter to me than i ever dreamed it could be till last night and it must be my endeavour to find a useful career for myself at home gertrude grew deadly pale yes she understood it all now he was looking down at elizabeth while he spoke looking down at her with love unspeakable it was clear enough now elizabeth was to have this priceless boon flung into her lap elizabeth who had done nothing to deserve it i want you to accept me as your brother gertrude said mr ford and you diana and you blanche i mean to do my best to supply the place of the brother you never had oh there was the baby said blanche with a matter-of-fact air such a poor wee thing christened will not chevenny trelawney and died half an hour afterwards such a waste of good family names mr ford held out his hand as he made this offer of brotherly affection but no one took it diana gave a little laugh and got up from her seat to look out of the window gertrude stood like a statue looking at the curate you seem surprised by my news miss luttrell he said at last struck by her singular manner i'm more than surprised said gertrude after the things i've heard my sister say after some things that you have said yourself too however i suppose one ought never to be surprised at anything in this world i hope you may be very happy mr ford but i do not remember ever having heard of so unsuitable a match she said this with calm deliberation having just sufficient self-command to keep the tempest of angry feelings pent up in her breast for the moment and having delivered herself of this opinion left the room it will be for us to find out that won't it lizzie said the curate looking after her wonderingly your eldest sister hardly accepts our new relationship in so pleasant a spirit as i hope she would have shown towards me perhaps she wanted you for herself said elizabeth with a scornful laugh she's made no secret of worshipping you diana blanche we are to be good friends i hope this with a kind of appeal to the two others who this time responded warmly enough oh, believe me there's no one we could like better than you said diana i'm sure we dote upon you cried blanche i may say it now you're going to be my brother but you see we were taken a little back at first for elizabeth is the beauty of our family and there's been so much talk with aunt chevenix and one and another about the grand marriage she was to make so it does seem rather a come down you know blanche exclaimed elizabeth furiously oh, 
don't i say that we all dote upon him expostulated blanche but however good your family may be you know mr ford and however independent your position and all that kind of thing a curate isn't a viscount you know and after lord paulyn's attentions blanche if you don't hold your tongue don't be angry with her pleaded malcolm i can forgive lord paulyn for having admired you and your family for expecting all mankind to bow down and worship you so long as you can forgive me for having made you disappoint them diana beheld her with wonder had worldly ambition had a boldly declared heartlessness come to so poor an end as this but when diana and blanche were alone together presently elizabeth having gone into the garden to see her lover off with a rapid appropriation of her rights as his affianced the younger sister shook her head sagely how blind you must be di she said i knew all about it ever so long ago she was always madly in love with him i have heard her say such things i used to fancy she liked him a little once but i thought lord paulyn had put all of that out of her head and that she'd set her heart on becoming a viscountess elizabeth is a mixture said blanche sententiously one moment the most mercenary being in the world and the next like that classic party with a name something like sophia ready to throw herself off a rock for love it'll be rather nice though to have mr ford for a brother won't it di it would have been nicer to have had a viscount responded diana in the bleak garden once more the march winds buffeting them the daffodils waving at their feet the world a paradise was papa very much surprised inquired elizabeth oh, yes darling more surprised than i had expected to find him for he had evidently learned to consider lord paulyn almost your plighted lover oh how absurd cried the girl with a little toss of her head such an idea would never have entered papa's mind of itself he's not a person to have ideas oh, but aunt chevenix talks such rubbish just because lord paulyn came here a great deal i suppose this was about the only place he had to come to on the days he didn't hunt i think there would be a few more houses open to him within a radius of ten miles although he does not bear a very high character said mr ford gravely oh perhaps however he seemed to like coming here replied elizabeth carelessly i am sorry he has not a good character for he's not at all a bad-natured young man although one is apt to get tired of his society after an hour or so you're not going to be jealous of him i hope i should be very jealous of any farther friendship of any farther acquaintance even between him and my future wife he is not a good man believe me elizabeth there are things i cannot possibly tell you but he is known to have led a bad life i think you must know that i am not a collector of scandal but his character is notorious you were jealous of him that sunday at lunch malcolm she said in her childish way clinging to his arm with a timid fondness i saw you scowling at us and i was prouder of your anger than i was of his admiration and then you kept away and i saw no more of you for ages and i thought you a monster of coldness and cruelty yes dear i was savagely jealous and oh my darling promise me that there'll be no more intimacy between that man and you i hate the idea of this visit to your aunt's for that reason above all you'll meet him in town perhaps you'll have aunt chevenix by your side dropping her worldly poison into your ear will you be deaf to all her arguments will you be true and pure and noble in spite of her i will be nothing that you disapprove said elizabeth and then with a little burst of truthfulness she went on do trust me malcolm i only want just one little peep at the world before i bid it good-bye for ever the world about which i've dreamed so much it will be only for a few weeks very well dear i will trust you if you could not pass scathless through such an ordeal you would be hardly worthy of an honest man's love my dearest treasure i will hazard you i think i can trust you elizabeth 
but if you cannot come back to me pure and true for god's sake let me never look upon your face again end of chapter thirteen end of book one